I'll begin this afternoon session with a brief introduction. Welcome to the Canadian Institute of Forestry's National Electronic Lecture Program. My name is Sharon Young, and I will be hosting today's session. Today is Wednesday, April 10th, 2024, and this is the last session in the e-lecture series entitled Sharing Knowledge on Some Key Initiatives Happening Across the Canadian Forest Service. The series is brought to you by the Canadian Forest Service and the Canadian Wood Fiber Centre. The CIF IFC is very pleased to collaborate and host these webinars. For today's session, we are pleased to have Christine Kansman, who will give an exciting presentation titled Analyzing and Predicting Fire Refugia in Western Canadian Forests. To kick things off, Christine holds a Master of Science degree in Forest Biology and Management from the University of Alberta, where she focused on determining the drivers of fire refugia in boreal Alberta through remote sensing techniques. This led her to a position studying fire ecology as a climate change analyst with the Canadian Forest Service through the Northern Forestry Center in Edmonton, Alberta where she's worked to further develop fire refugia research throughout much of Western Canada. She will be discussing both of these projects with us today. With that, I will now pass it over to Christine. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about two different projects today. The first one is going to be about fire refugia in Boreal, Alberta. As mentioned, this was part of my master's thesis through the University of Alberta. Uh, I did this in Scott Nielsen's lab, and I worked together with Deanna Stralberg, Ellen Whitman, Mark Prezian, and Dan Thompson of the CFS. And then once I wrapped up that portion of the presentation, I'll move over into the BC side of things, where I do something really similar, except it's for all the forested areas throughout the province, not just select regions. And for this project, again, I worked together with Diana and Ellen, but also Doug Lewis of the BC government. And so with that, I will just get started on some background information. So as many of you will probably know, fire is generally thought to benefit the local environment by promoting a diverse landscape. But that being said, increases in fire activity can be detrimental, and this is especially true in the forests of Western Canada, where the trees are particularly vulnerable to drought following fire. And actually some models have suggested that there could be widespread vegetation changes that result from the combined effects of both climate change, as well as increases to fire activity. So one aspect of fire that has been changing in recent decades is their severity. And fire severity is defined as the ecological impacts on vegetation and soils of a burn. High severity fires, especially if they become more frequent, can alter vegetation regeneration processes through things like the combustion of organic soils, damage to root systems, and overstory tree mortality. The end result being a decrease in seed and cone availability to then regenerate those stands once more. And this allows an opportunity for other species to come in and establish instead. So in both of these projects, we're considering fire refugia to be patches of live tree canopy within fire perimeters that survive the burn. So this is an example here uh, in this photo. And these areas of refugia are created through a combination of unique site characteristics, as well as the spatial patterning of fire severity and movement across the landscape. Fire refugia are considered to be quite important for post-fire recovery processes. And this is because they behave a lot like islands do. So they retain those pre-fire plant communities inside of them. And these then go on to help reseed that surrounding burn with reference vegetation once again. And these abilities might be able to help mitigate the combined effects of climate change and natural disturbance by promoting forest resilience and ecosystem resistance to those vegetation changes. So our definition of fire refugia uh, comes from some work that Ellen Whitman did as part of a 2020 paper where she developed this Alberta burn severity atlas. Um, of particular interest to us was this relativized burn ratio or RBR, and that is a continuous fire severity metric. Within that metric, she developed a threshold value wherein anything above the value could be considered to have burnt at some capacity and anything at or below it could be considered as refugia. This was calibrated for the Western Canadian Boreal, so it works quite well in our Alberta study area, and it's been found to correspond quite meaningfully with field measures of burn severity, particularly the Composite Burn Index, or CBI. 
So there has been some past work done on trying to tease apart what exactly is driving these pockets of refugia, uh, but most of the work that's been done to date has focused on quite mountainous areas or areas at least with quite diverse terrain. Um, and unsurprisingly, this diverse terrain has been found to be a major contributor to the formation of refugia. But refugia do still form in quite flat areas like the boreal, so obviously something else is driving them in this kind of an area. And in the Alberta boreal in particular, peatlands in the form of bogs and fens have some pretty unique characteristics about them. So for example, they can resist drying for longer periods of time than uplands can. They contain patches of standing water, especially when you're talking about fens. And they just to help to create a more diverse fuel structure overall. And all of these factors are things that can go on to help produce refugia here. And in this case, that might also include in neighboring upland stands as well, depending on their hydrologic connectivity to those peatlands. One thing you're going to hear me talk about quite a bit over the following slides is this concept of bottom up versus top down controls. Uh, so the bottom-up controls are related to things like terrain, fuels, soil moisture, and things like that, whereas the top-down controls are more related to things like climate, weather, month of burn, uh, and so on. So it's important to know the contribution of each of these towards fire activity, since they can tell us what to expect from fire in different regions and suggest ways that we could potentially mitigate the effects of fire when and where needed. So for example, in the bottom-up controls, strong and diverse terrain features like mountains or valleys can be an indication of some potential for persistent or long-term refugia to form. And these are spots of refugia that are capable of surviving multiple fire events, not just one or two. Uh, fuels are another bottom-up control, and they're the only one that we have a direct and immediate control over ourselves. So of course, fuels can be altered through things like targeted planting of fire-resistant species or deciduous species. We can also do things like fuel thinning or prescribed burns to help clear out fuel buildups and offer an additional measure of protection to areas we want to try and conserve. Uh, and then in terms of the top down controls, the one that we're mainly interested in here is climate. So this lets us know what to expect from fire under various regional climates, as well as what to expect under con extreme conditions and how that affects patterns of fire spread. So in Alberta, we had four main objectives that we wanted to touch on. The first was to determine whether peatlands had a higher likelihood of producing refugia when compared to uplands. Uh, second, we wanted to see what the relative contribution of those top-down and bottom-up controls were. Third, we were interested in seeing how the amount of surrounding peatlands was affecting refugia creation in neighboring uplands and peatlands. And finally, we wanted to see how fire refugia in these areas adjacent to peatlands were responding to drought. So this is our study area here. It's the majority of the Alberta boreal and makes up about half of the province. It is a little bit over 465,000 square kilometers. And as you can see in this image here, it's mainly comprised of different upland ecosystems with fens being the second most common type followed by bogs, uh, whereas swamps and marshes are relatively rare on the landscape in comparison to those groups. And of course we do have several different water features here as well. So this slide is detailing both our covariates as well as our sample. I have everything grouped up into different categories or different boxes depending on their shared relationships to fire. The ones along the bottom there, those are all of our different covariates and I've just let, um, added little asterisks in here to let you know whether this was a top-down or bottom-up control as you can see in the top legend there. So I'll start off with our fire sample. So for this, again, we were using Ellen Whitman's Fire Severity Atlas for our Burn Severity Index, and we also used the Canadian National Fire Database to get information on all of our fires. Both of these are CFS products. If anybody is looking for something like this, we do carry it. So in order to be considered in our sample, a fire had to have burned between 1985 and 2018, and it had to be at least 200 hectares in size. To get our dependent variable of this fire refugia versus burn binary. Again, we use that RBR metric as well as Ellen's threshold that she developed. Uh, and then it's included in the sample slide, but it's actually one of our covariates. We also took a measure of the size of every fire as well and factored that into our models too. So for the different covariates, I'll start off with the bottom up controls. The first grouping here is physical setting. So as you can see, these are all dealing with different aspects of terrain, although we do also have a couple variables dealing with surrounding water. 
Next, we have fuels disturbance and ecosystem type. And then lastly, NDVI, which is just a measure of vegetation greenness versus brownness. And then for the top down controls, these all have to deal with different aspects of climate. So we have a few different varieties here. We have normals, annuals, and anomalies. Those normals are corresponding with regional climates uh, as averaged over a 30-ish year period. The annuals, of course, are just what's happening year to year. And then those anomalies are the annual deviation from the norm. And this is the important one here because this is where we got our measure of drought from. So using that sample and all those different variables, we put together 17 different logistic regression models. Uh, so one of these is an ecosystem comparison model, and it just has the different ecosystem types in it. So the bog, fen, marsh, et cetera. This is the only model that is based on a sample of the entire landscape. For all of our other models, we split the sample up into uplands versus peatlands, and then we modeled those two separately. So here we have 14 different component models. And in this, they had their variables partitioned into different groups based on shared relationships to fire. So a lot like what I just showed in that last slide, but a little bit more specific. And then finally, we have two predictive or full models. These ones contained all of the different variables, as well as some of what we imagined would be pretty significant interactions. And then the one constant between all of these models, uh, aside from the dependent variable, of course, was our measure of fire size. So that went into everything. So for the ecosystem comparison model, we found that all treed wetland types tended to have more refugia in them when compared to uplands. Mm -hmm. That being said though, we did find that bogs did not show a significant difference from upland. And actually marshes were just an incidental inclusion. So again, we had tried to limit our sample as best we could to just include treed pixels and marshes are not generally considered to be treed. So there was a bit of a discrepancy between a couple of the layers that we were using for that filtering step and a few marsh pixels ended up sneaking in on us there. For the component models in the upland version, we found that the top performing model was climate followed by NDVI. So the top down controls followed by one of the bottom ups. And then in terms of the peatland version, this time around, we found that physical setting followed by the amount of surrounding wetlands were the two most um, well-performing models here, both of which are bottom up controls. For the predictive models in the upland version, we found that increasing amounts of bogs tended to have a positive relationship with refugia, whereas fens didn't tend to have a significant effect. And uplands that were surrounded by bogs were around six times more likely to produce refugia than those that did not have those bogs around them. In terms of climate, we found that uplands situated within wetter regional climates tended to have more refugia as those annual drought conditions intensified, whereas uplands situated in drier regional climates saw the reverse of that. For the peatland version, this time around, we found that increasing amounts of both bogs and fens tended to have a positive effect on refugia, and large peatlands were about twice as likely to produce refugia when compared to smaller ones. However, in this model, we found that drought didn't have a significant effect, so that variable was dropped from this version. From those models, we made four different predictive maps, and these are showing both climatic as well as seasonal variation. So here we're using artificial wet and dry years to represent climatic variation, and we're considering May to be our early fire season, whereas August is late. This is an example of a couple of the maps that were produced. As you can tell, they are very, very detailed, so I won't go too into the weeds with them here, but I can say that overall, we found fire refugia to be highest in valleys and low-lying areas. Also, the early fire season and the wet year tended to produce more refugia than the late fire season conditions or the dry year did. So that was everything for Alberta. I'm going to move over to the BC side of things now. Again, we did this for all forested areas throughout the province instead of just one or two regions. There are a couple important changes between this version and that last one. So the first change is that we've expanded those bottom-up controls to include more variables dealing with terrain, since BC definitely has a lot stronger and more diverse terrain features in comparison to the previous study area. Um, also, instead of using R and ARC for our processing, this time around we're using Google Earth Engine. And there's a couple different reasons for that change. So the first is that it really improves our workflow. Uh, when this was done before using R and ARC, 
there were dozens and dozens of layers that went into it that needed to be processed and created before we could even get to the analysis step. And that process took us months to do. And any time that there was a change or correction that needed to be made, that had the potential to set us back quite a bit. So by using Google Earth Engine, what took us months previously is now being done in minutes or in some cases seconds. So it's way more efficient. Um, so it's really nice to progress a bit quicker in that sense. Uh, the other benefit to it is that it's free and it's open source. So once everything is published and the repositories are online, anybody that has a free account can easily access things like our variables, our methods, and our final predictions um, so that they can easily hit the ground running uh, with those methods if they want to build something like this in their area, or they can easily uh, access those predictions and play around with them for areas that they're interested in. And the final big change here is that we're using machine learning this time around, uh, specifically boosted regression trees. And that is better for a project like this um, in comparison to just simple logistic regression models because machine learning can handle things like nonlinearity and interactions automatically. There are a lot of factors that go into any aspect of FHIR, and there are a lot of interactions between those factors. So it can be quite difficult to a priori think of all the interactions that could possibly occur and then factor those into your models. So with machine learning, it does all of that for you. And in the end, it just makes for much more accurate models. So in BC, we had three main objectives. The first, again, was to see what those major drivers of refugia were in different regions uh, in terms of the top-down and bottom-up controls. Uh, the interesting aspect that we've added here is we're looking at whether fire refugia and old growth forests are overlapping. So if they do overlap, that would be an indication that there's an element of persistence to those refugia spots, very likely due to those bottom-up controls. And then lastly, of course, we want to make those province-wide predictions so that everybody else can use this in their own research. So owing to those really diverse terrain features, as well as that strong coastal influence, BC has a diversity of different fire regimes. It has 23 unique fire regime units, or FRUs. If anybody has ever used BC's Beck Zone product, uh, the BC portion of these FRUs is based quite a bit around that. And these FRUs differ from one another based on their fire-related attributes. So these are things like topography, vegetation composition, climate, and patterns of fire, frequency, severity, and intensity. This is our sample and variable slide again. Uh, it's following the same format as before. Uh, so this time around, we are primarily using NBAC for our fire perimeters as well as our fire information. This is also a CFS product if, again, anybody's looking for something like this. And then for the burn severity index, we're using RBR again, but we're using BC's adaptation of it. So the BC side of things took Ellen's code to have created that metric, and they applied it to fires in their province to make their own fire severity rasters, which they then kindly shared with us. Uh, the study period has moved over just a little bit in this case to keep with the years a bit available through the um, publicly available version of NBAC. So here it's 1986 to 2019. We've also brought down our fire size threshold from 200 to 130 hectares. So we were able to include some smaller fires. And this is because generally speaking, BC doesn't tend to have the mega fires that we see up in the Alberta Boreal. Again, we're using that RBR. Um, we've been able to keep that threshold value the same. Uh, we ended up doing some background analyses on some fires within the Okanagan to see if that threshold was still going to work. And it actually did a very good job. So we were able to keep it the same. Uh, again, that's what we use to get our dependent variable of this fire refugia versus burn binary. We did try and factor in fire size in these models again, but with our preliminary results, we were getting some kind of uh, weird results that we couldn't really explain very well, other than the fact that we know that there are some mapping issues for older fires, especially the smaller ones. So we ended up taking out that variable in the end, and we have replaced it with the month in which every fire started. Again, it's grouped up with the sample here, but this time around that's being factored in with our top-down controls. So speaking of those covariates, again, I'll start off with the bottom-ups. Uh, the first group again is physical setting. You can see that this time around, we have a lot more variables dealing with aspects of terrain, uh, but we still do have one dealing with surrounding water. Next, we have annual fuels and disturbance, and finally, NDVI once again. 
Um, and then for our top-down controls, once more, we are looking primarily at climatic factors. So we have those normals and anomalies once more, and then just one more annual measure. So we had intended to model all these FRUs separately, but there were a few cases where an FRU either didn't have a good diversity of fires in it or had too small of a sample size to model individually. So in the cases where this happened, what we did was we consulted with our experts in BC and they helped us to find the most similar FRU to the one in question. And once that was found, we grouped and modeled them together. So that's why, for example, when you look at the boreal, you'll have numbers like FRU 30 slash 58, whereas in the subarctic, it's just 45. Um, so that's what's happening there. Just for brevity and to be able to quickly summarize a lot of different results, we've grouped them into seven distinct regions here. Um, I've tried my best to color code them all um, and have them correspond to this map so you can tell where they're all falling. Uh, just keep in mind, if you're interested in a particular area, there is going to be a lot of variation both amongst and between the models. Uh, they won't necessarily reflect um, the broad scale results that I'm going to show here. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go forward. So one benefit of using these uh, machine learning techniques is that it will give you a measure of model accuracy in your results. In this case, it's the cross-validation AUC. It's telling you how accurate your model is or how well it's performing. And essentially, the closer you are to a value of one, the better your model is doing. So you can see in our version here, across the board, all of our values are in the 80s or in some cases higher than that. So we can say that our models are performing quite well and they are quite accurate, which is nice. The other thing you want to look at is your explanatory power. That's usually done through R squared or in our case, pseudo R squared. So this is telling us how much of the variance is being explained by our variables. Um, and again, the larger your value is, the more explanatory power you have. Uh, so what these results are telling us is that while our model accuracy is high, their explanatory power is around medium. But that's not really surprising, given that fire weather conditions at the time of burning has a huge impact on patterns of fire spread. But at this point in time, our models don't include variables to reflect that. So given that we are missing a pretty big piece of the puzzle, these results are actually explaining quite a bit and are doing a very good job. So before I get into the broader regional results, I just want to focus on what we've been seeing in the BC Boreal to kind of compare and contrast that to what we found in Alberta. So on the left hand side, that is a stacked variable importance plot. It has all the variables grouped up into different categories and uh, split into top down versus bottom up controls with those bottom up controls being further split into fuels versus physical setting to better tease apart the differences there. So you can see that in the boreal, fuels and physical setting definitely outrank the top down controls, but they're actually neck and neck with one another. I think if you zoom in, the fuels one is just a tiny bit higher than physical setting. And that's not really surprising to see given that this is our flattest area in BC. And because it's lacking a lot of that strong and diverse terrain, something else has to come up and take that importance. Uh, in this case, it turned out to be fuels. And then on the right hand side here, this is another variable importance plot, but this time it's showing the top 20 most important variables in the northern portion of the boreal, um, which is the most similar to what we saw in the Alberta side of things. And I have included a few different uh, symbols here just to give an idea of overall effect direction. So the positive and negative symbols are pretty self explanatory, it's either a positive or a negative effect. And those Vs are indicating a variable or simply nonlinear effect on refugia. And I wanted to point out that the top three most important variables, out of all of those, two of them have to deal with the amount of surrounding open wetlands. And both of those cases are having a positive effect on refugia, which is mirroring what we saw in Alberta um, and is quite exciting to see this being reflected here as well. So these are all the different stacked variable bar charts for um, all the different regions. So we can see that the majority of the time, physical setting was the most important of the groupings in most of the models. That being said though, fuels do beat it out in some places, especially in the interior. And again, in the boreal, it's just a hair more important than the bottom up controls. And then in terms of the top downs, they're generally not as important as those bottom up ones are, but they are quite high in some areas. 
So places like the coast, the boreal, and the interior wet belt, their importance is really high. Um, and actually in the subarctic, just above that Canada logo there, they're actually outranking the fuels category. That's the only case where the top downs outrank one of the bottom ups. They're making up over 30% of the importance that we're getting for predicting refugia. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that we already know that the climate is changing more rapidly in the subarctic compared to many of the other regions. So that also explains why that dark orange bar representing the climate anomalies, why that is so huge in this area. So here I'm highlighting three areas where climate, especially those anomalies are really important. So even though when taken together, as we saw in the previous slide, the top-down controls generally aren't as important as the bottom-up ones are, except in the case of the subarctic, but we can see here that in some places they are still of very high importance, and they're actually capable of overwhelming those typically strong bottom-up controls when those climate conditions become extreme. So for example, along the coast, on the left-hand side there, that measure of drought is overwhelming the bottom-up controls and is going on to have a negative impact on refugia. Also, just to call back to that last slide, when you look at the results for the subarctic, you can see just how important the changes in temperature are there. And that would be why we saw the top-down controls outranking fuels in that area. So since this is a presentation for the CIF, I also wanted to highlight the importance that we're finding of cut blocks, which are those yellow bars. So in these three areas, the variables for cut blocks are showing up really prominently in the top 20. And with the exception of the boreal, where their effect is generally variable, the cut blocks are typically having a positive effect on refugia. And that's in spite of differences in scale between the variables, as well as differences in age relative to the fires in the sample. So I thought that was kind of neat to show. And then based on those models, we've made these predictive maps. Every FRU was mapped separately, and then we stitched everything together for comprehensive provincial maps. Every FRU has 10 maps in total. Again, these show both climatic and seasonal variation. This time around, only one of our years is an artificial one, and that is our average year. For our wet and dry years, we use real values from real years for those ones. Uh, and then in terms of the seasonal variation, once again, we're considering May to be our early fire season, July to be peak, and September to be late. And we've also added an additional map here. This one is focused on topography. Um, so this has all the other variables held constant at their means, and it's going to give us an indication of where those areas of persistent or longer term refugia might form based only on those static long term terrain features. So these are a couple of the maps that were produced. They're both showing peak or July fire season conditions. Uh, 2016 was our wet year, whereas 2017 was our dry year. And generally speaking, 2016 tends to have more refugia than 2017 does. Keeping in mind, though, that these are real values from real years. So those wet and dry conditions weren't universal across the entirety of the province in both cases. There are some areas where they kind of flip around a little bit. So, for example, in the Haida Gwaii and the coastal areas just to the east of it, those conditions were actually drier in 2016 compared to 2017. And that's being reflected in these refugia probabilities. So you can see in 2017, Haida Gwaii is very dark blue, whereas in the 2016 version is quite a bit lighter, and that's reflective of uh, decreasing or increasing refugia probability between the two. So again, these are both showing uh, peak fire season conditions. The one on the left is our average prediction, and the one on the right is our topography one. So that average map generally is predicting less refugia than 2016 and more than 2017. And as expected, the topography version is showing the least amount of refugia, as this one is based mainly on those static terrain features, and it's representing the possible persistent refugia spots only. So it's not including any spots of refugia that would have been short term and created by other conditions at the time of burning. Uh, so that's why it's quite a bit more yellow than the other versions are. So here, that large map is showing 2017 conditions, and I just wanted to zoom in on some particular areas uh, to show a close-up version of what's going on, so it's a little bit easier to compare the two years together. Any of those little maps that have the lines leading towards the big map, those are showing 2017 conditions, whereas the ones without the line are showing 2016. Uh, I picked three pretty distinct areas here. So the one along the bottom, that is for the coast. It's on Vancouver Island. The one in the middle is for the interior, and I believe it's somewhere near Quinnell, although I could be wrong. 
Uh, and the one at the top there, that is the boreal portion. I think that the nearest town is high level um, on the Alberta side of things. So along the coast, if anybody has ever been there before, it's really obvious that the area has a lot of very strong and diverse terrain. It has a lot of mountains and valleys and waterfalls and things like that. Uh, it also gets a ton of rain. But we can see in these two maps that even though it has those strong bottom-up controls, they can still be overwhelmed by periods of extreme climate, particularly drought in this case. And that was being reflected in those VIP plots that I showed earlier, as well as in these maps here. In the interior portion, there is some strong terrain there still, but this is largely rolling hills and plateaus. Uh, this area, though, was one of the ones that was more controlled by fuels than by anything else. So it's really not surprising to see refugia going down in that dry year as the fuels dry out, and it's easier for fires just to spread right through them. And then up in the boreal, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting, and we're actually seeing more refugia forming in the dry year compared to the wet year which seems kind of counterintuitive, especially when you're taking a look at the other regions. But just keep in mind that the Alberta work had showed that wetter boreal areas, especially when you're talking about uplands, those produce more refugia in a dry year. So some of what we're seeing here could be reflecting that result as well. So here I'm lining up some predictions from Alberta versus BC uh, in the boreal section. These are both representing May of a wet period. So just keeping in mind that both of the projects use really different modeling techniques, uh, different data sets and different variables, they don't line up perfectly and we don't expect them to, but they are definitely showing some similarities in terms of broad scale spatial patterns. And part of the reason for the difference here is that those machine learning techniques allow for a lot more specificity than the typical regression ones do. Uh, so that helps to explain why the BC side of thing is showing a lot more variation in terms of the predictions than the more general side uh, over in Alberta. So over the next several slides, I'm going to be showing our predictions versus some real fires. What we're looking at within the real fires are those dark purple areas that are representing locations where refugia did form. The fires that I'm going to be showing come from 2021, whereas the predictions are coming from 2017, uh, both of which are dry years. And you'll notice in the example of this boreal fire here that the predictions don't line up perfectly with spots of real refugia. And part of the reason for that is because if you remember, our sample stopped in 2019 and this fire is from 2021. So it didn't go on into the sample. It didn't have a direct influence on the models or the predictions. And it's actually been withheld for future validation steps. So that explains a little bit of the discrepancy here. So for a bit of a closer look, uh, here's a zoomed in version of the predictions lined up against those spots of real refugia. Uh, so again, the predictions are not perfect, but they are suggesting that refugia might form in the vicinity of areas where refugia actually did occur. And it's not surprising that our predictions weren't spot on in this boreal fire, since past research has shown that uh, it's the hardest to predict refugia in these flat areas, since at, in those places, the uh, stochastic or random nature of fire weather conditions tend to have an either, even greater effect on patterns of fire spread, uh, just due to those more limited terrain features. So this isn't really surprising to see in this particular fire. So here I have put up some base map imagery to try and show what some potential drivers of those refugia spots might be. Uh, all three of them are showing differing vegetation structures near where refugia formed. That upper left one has a pipeline running through it, which would have offered a little bit of a fuel break in that spot, while the other two have wetlands and seismic lines. There's also a big wetland complex just south to the one on the far right that very likely went on to influence um, where that spot of refugia was created. So overall, this is suggesting that boreal fire refugia are being influenced by wetlands and fuel structures. But since the predictions weren't incredible here, it's also very likely that fire weather conditions at the time of burning were also playing a very important role, uh, particularly in this fire. So this is another 2021 fire lined up against our 2017 predictions. This time it's in the central interior. Uh, this one is a much bigger fire, um, and this area does have some strong terrain features in the form of those rolling hills and plateaus, as well as some strong water features there. There's also a lot of cut blocks of various ages, both within this fire and surrounding it as well. 
And in this case, our 2017 predictions are doing a much better job at predicting refugia in spots that they actually did occur in, which is really encouraging to see. Uh, and when you look at the base map imagery here, all three of these areas have regenerating cut blocks from around 2000 to 2004. So they occurred way before this fire happened, and they're at different stages of regeneration when it came through. Uh, the image on the right there, it's showing either a shallow valley or a stream bed, as well as some surrounding meadows. And the one along the bottom has some water features there, which I believe are wetlands. It also looks like it has some pretty clear terrain changes. So I think it's sitting in the bottom of a valley. Uh, and so therefore we can say that forest structure, especially in this case, past disturbance, is playing a big role in this area. Uh, although wetlands and terrain are also big factors in some places as well. So here what I'm showing are the results of our fire refugia versus old growth contingency table analysis. And basically what it's telling us is how well are our topography predictions lining up with mapped areas of old growth based on their odds ratio values. So in this case, a value below one is showing that there's a better than random chance of refugia and old growth overlapping. We did try a few different prediction threshold values and I'm just showing one of them here. So that left column shows the color-coded FRUs. Um, so you can match that up with the map at the top and get an idea of where these FRUs are falling within the province. Uh, the middle column is showing how well our sample is lining up with old growth, whereas the one on the right shows how well our, our topography predictions are doing. So our predictions are lining up pretty well with mapped old growth, as you would expect to see. Um, there are a few spots though, where the values are above one, and there's a couple explanations for this. So first and foremost, we know that the map that we use for old growth does have mapping issues in some areas where it's over predicting spots of old growth. Um, but also we did use a pretty high prediction threshold in this version. And so it's probably also an indication that uh, some of these regions didn't have refugia probabilities above 50%. And so those two factors together are at least some of the explanation of why some of these areas have those larger values. So to start wrapping up, we can say that overall, the bottom-up controls were the strongest. Um, fuels were of highest importance in places like the boreal and the interior, whereas physical setting was of highest importance in places like the alpine, the coast, subarctic, and interior wet belt. That being said, though, those bottom-up controls can be overwhelmed by periods of extreme climate, and depending on where you are in the province, that can go on to have either a negative or a positive effect on refugia. For some next steps, uh, the first one will, to, will be to validate our predictions against those withheld fires from 2020 through 22. Um, so what we saw in those slides before was just a visual comparison. We do have to still do the actual analysis to validate them. Uh, while we work on that, we've also started a new project doing something very similar up in the Northwest Territories. Uh, so a big change in this version is that we're not going to be constraining ourselves to provincial boundaries. So any FRU that was present within the NWT that's also shared with a neighboring province, that's going to be uh, analyzed and mapped out in its entirety. So by the time we finish that, we will have this big area that I'm showing, as well as Alberta and BC. So we will have analyzed and mapped much of Western Canada at that point, which is pretty exciting. And while we're working on both of those things, we're also working on making some publicly available web maps through Google Earth Engine apps so that people can just jump on there and take a look at our predictions, zoom in, play around with them, uh, take a look at their jurisdiction of interest and things like that. And then just in terms of this work uh, um, for how it could influence management, in terms of conservation, we could use it to help conserve a diversity of plant communities and seed sources under a range of different conditions and different terrain to help promote the most biodiversity we possibly can. Those maps in particular could be used to locate areas of safe haven or connectivity for species as they try and move across the landscape in the face of natural disturbance. And then in terms of management, we could use the work to help locate those areas of persistent refugia to perhaps undergo some protective measures. So protection in this case could mean things like prescribing low severity burns to help clear out fuel buildups, or potentially informing harvesters of where areas should be left intact for their refugia creating potentials. And then finally, in terms of old growth management, uh, especially in the interior, we saw how cut blocks were having a positive effect on refugia creation in those areas. 
So if there is a location of old growth that we would like to try and protect, potentially we could thin the fuels around them to offer a little bit more protection uh, through a fuel break. Um, we could use the maps to help predict areas inside proposed cut blocks that would likely have been refugia if that cut had been a burn instead. And we can also just try and um, promote a more diverse fuel structure in terms of things like age, species, and phases to better emulate natural disturbance patterns. And with that, that was everything I had for today. Uh, thank you very much again for attending and thank you to our funding providers. This is the contact information for the lead authors on the BC project. If you wanna reach out to any of us, we are always happy to chat fire. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christine. That was a great presentation. Before moving on to the questions, I'm just gonna launch the poll. Uh, it's a post webinar survey and there are two questions in total. You may need to scroll down to see the next question. All right, um, so Christine, the first question for you in the, uh, the Q&A pod is, can these fire refugia areas be considered to preserve some of the original forest ecology? Um, potentially, I mean, if they are the persistent ones, that means that they have survived multiple fire events. And given that in some of these areas, those fire events can be multiple decades apart, um, that would mean that the forests can get to be quite old. Um, so I would say that, yeah, in some areas, it definitely could be. Thank you. Um, yeah. I see we have one of the participants raised uh, her hand. So I'm going to allow Trisha Hook to talk. Uh, let's see if we could hear her. Oh, she just lowered her hand. Oh. <laughs> um, no worries. Um, there's another question from the chat. Uh, what was the fact of fire size in the Alberta project? Right, yeah. So I didn't detail the results of that, but it actually was a pretty interesting result. So we found that in every single upland model, the effect of fire size was negative on refugia. So as fires got larger, refugia went down, but actually in every single peatland model, we saw that fire size had a positive effect. So that was kind of interesting to see when we split the two up there. Thank you, Christine. Uh, if there are no more questions, I would like to bring this session to close. Thank you all for participating in our CIF electronic lectures. And once again, thank you very much to Christine for this great presentation. Bye, everyone. Thank you.